evening, everybody. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Just wait for a few more to join. Kerry, I'm in now. Do you want me to start? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. Just okay. let a few people join us. Well, good evening, one and all. A second week running. We've had a few technical issues before we start, so apologies for being two minutes late starting us off. Um, Tim was struggling to join us. He has now joined us under the guise of Kerry Portier, so there's two of me tonight. I wonder if Tim can rename himself. Um, or I can, yeah, I can be you Tim. Let's do that, shall we? Um, if not, everyone's going to get very confused. We're in. So we've had a few issues to begin with. Um, we, probably Tim is now here, so we're all good. I'm afraid Paul is meant to be joining us this evening. Um, he's a bit family emergency, so won't be joining us. That means you've got Tim twice. So. Um, this evening, we are going cruising, and I think that's just as well, because last week, I very optimistically said at the start that it's February, we're edging towards spring, it's in sight, and then suddenly it got really cold again, and I've been defrosting my car this week. So um, I'm very happy to be going to Baja California, all the way to the Galapagos, via Western Canada and Indonesia, or maybe something like that. Yeah, somewhere in between. Um, some wonderful destinations, so um, I hope you're all ready for a lovely evening. We are also joined by Alison Steele, one of our operations managers from the office, and Nature Tech MD, Andy Tucker. Um, Tim, many of you hopefully have travelled with over the years, one of our most um, long-standing and wonderful tour leaders. Um, so Tim is going to cover Baja California as planned. Um, he's not doing the Spirit Bears talk, but he will cover Western Canada, um, so the same neck of the woods, just not necessarily on a boat. Um, what we're hoping is that Paul can record a specific spirit bears talk for us um, over the next sort of week or so, and we'll put that on the website. So anyone who's very specifically interested in the spirit bears cruise can catch up on it that way. As ever, um, we have the chat function available, so feel free to use that to, to talk to us, um, to ask us any questions, to tell us your memories of trips that you've done. Um, and we have the Q&A box, so any specific questions you can pop in there. Generally, we type a few answers during the evening and then um, we will wrap up um, the rest of them at the end. And we've, we'll have about 20 minutes um, after we've all finished speaking to, to go through any questions that you might have. Um, we'll also have a ten, no, five minute break in the middle, and, as we always do. Um, so I will leave it there, stop talking. I will hand over to Tim. Hopefully this is going to work and um, I'll let Tim share his screen and take you where are we going? I'm all out of sorts because I didn't know what <laughs> It's Baja, California. Baja, California. Perfect. Over to you then, Tim. All right. Is that, is that, is that working? That is working. And we're Brilliant. Baja. Perfect. I'll leave you to it. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, as uh, Kerry just said, I've been leading for uh, Nature Trek for uh, a number of years now, uh, about 25, I think it is. And I've been whale watching all over the world. I've whale watched in every ocean. And I can honestly say that Baja California and the Sea of Cortez is the best whale watching I've ever experienced anywhere. It's uh, during the course of the trip, you see hundreds of whales and thousands of dolphins. And that isn't an exaggeration. So uh, whereabouts is Baja California? Well, it's that little finger over on the uh, west side of Mexico. You can see it sort of uh, sticking down there. So that's the Baja Peninsula and the Sea of Cortez is the enclosed sea between that and the Mexican mainland. And what we do is we sail uh, all the way down it into the Sea of Cortez and then we usually fly back from the, uh, uh, the bottom of the peninsula. Um, we arrive in San Diego and we have uh, a, a full day to uh, uh, do whatever you like, but a lot of people like to go bird watching in the area so we uh, we go and see various things but I wasn't going to concentrate on that this is an Anna's hummingbird but it's one of many many different species that we see bird watching on the day but then we um, uh, uh, in the evening of, of that first day we board the boat the searcher and we start heading south 
and we travel through the night uh, and wake up in Mexico and then we start watching things. Um, brown pelicans are one of the, uh, the uh, totemic birds of the trip. They are just, you see them every day, they're everywhere in huge numbers, and uh, they're one that you sort of really grow to know and love. You can watch them hunting, and so uh, very familiar. And um, uh, another whale that I've seen on every single trip that I've led here is the fin whale, which is the second biggest uh, whale in the world. Um, I, I know that there are a few lookalikes, but one of the diagnostic features of fin whale is they have a white lower lip on the right side. So they're, um, uh, they're, uh, uh, they don't have the same color of lower lip on both sides. And you think, well, how can you do that in the field? But when you're in a small boat, you can go to the right side and have a look and see, oh yeah, there we go. That's a fin whale. It's got the white lower lip um, and that uh, eliminates the lookalikes like say whale as well. So, um, but it's, uh, so it, it, it's allowed you to, because we're in no real hurry, we can spend time and really get to enjoy and, uh, and absorb all these features really get to know the whales um, uh, that we're traveling down to see loads of birds uh, the, the birds are just phenomenal. Some of them are familiar, like sooty sheer waters that you've probably seen in Britain. And some of them are probably unfamiliar, like the tiny little Cassin's Auklet that nests in burrows on most of the uh, islands down there. We usually see two species of albatross, uh, the big black-footed albatross here, and the uh, Laysan albatross, um, uh, which is a bit like a black browed. But just to give you an idea of size, that western gull over on the right-hand side of the thing, of, of the screen, is about the same size as a great black back gull. And you can see that the albatross just absolutely dwarfs it. Uh, we often bump into rafts of wintering phalaropes on the sea. Uh, uh, they, they're often a mixture. They're mainly redneck phalaropes. And they've actually found out that uh, by radio tracking, uh, that the phalaropes that breed in Shetland actually go across America and cut across the uh, Central America and go and winter on the uh, uh, Pacific. So uh, these could well be um, Shetland birds in amongst these. Uh, these are, so these are the redneck phalaropes, but uh, also with a bit of, uh, of, of scanning through the flocks, we can find the, the larger build grey phalaropes as well, but they're always in winter plumage when you see them. Our first footfall uh, on uh, day two is an island called San Benitos, which is a lovely little oceanic island. It's got a number of endemic uh, uh, plants, and it's also notable because it's got a, uh, one of the strongest colonies of northern elephant seal uh, in the world. Uh, there's really good numbers of these, and uh, yeah, you can get uh, up close and personal with them like this. Um, there's a, a little fishing village that's only operational during the abalone season. And uh, so the, uh, the, the elephant seals just take over the, uh, the whole place and just lounge around in the streets there. So, uh, but, um, uh, you know, it's a, a quite an exciting thing to see. Uh, the males are really big and ugly, as you've seen, but the females have got a real beauty about them. Look at that enigmatic smile. It's like the, the Mona Lisa there, isn't it? Um, the, uh, there's also a really good population of ospreys on the island, several pairs of them. So you're seeing them all the time hunting around there. And and uh, just to show you, there's an elephant seal in the bottom there, but that little thing in the middle of the rock there it, on the edge of the ocean, it's an osprey nest. And you could climb up to that just as easily as you climb a stairs. It's, uh, um, it, it was, you know, really, really good like that. Um, there's also a unique bird on there, which is the San Benito Sparrow, which uh, doesn't go anywhere else on the in the world. It used to be considered a, uh, a subspecies of the Savannah Sparrow, but they've now decided that it's uh, a species in its own right. It's a good species. So there it is, Pasicula sanctorum, the San Benito Sparrow. And again, we have no problem finding those on the island. Uh, there are, uh, well, there's common seals, but there's also two species of, uh, of sea lions. There's a, uh, the, um, uh, that's the Guadalupe fur seal, the one with the pointed nose looking at the boat. And the one over on the right is a, a California sea lion. Guadalupe fur seal is actually a very rare uh, animal. It's only found on two uh, places, San Benitos and Guadalupe Island, which is a little further out into the uh, Pacific there. They have that pointed snout and, uh, and uh, soft fur all over, but that's, uh, you know, quite a rare seal to be seeing. Uh, the waders you get on there, because it's rocky islands, you tend to get rocky coast uh, waders, things like Black Turnstone and Wandering Tattler we usually see down there. 
And then uh, when we finished on San Benitos, we get back on the boat and it's quite warm weather. It's a great place to spend February, I'll tell you. And uh, we just go there and uh, see what turns up as we uh, head south. And what we're really looking for here is uh, dolphins and whales. And sometimes the dolphins come thick and fast. And, and the, the real, the really fantastic experience is when the uh, you, you come across a super pod of dolphins. And sometimes there are thousands of them. It, it, literally as far as the eye can see in all directions the ocean is just effervescing with dolphins um, this really doesn't capture the spirit of it but really you know they're just coming up and going down all over the place everywhere you look it's really really brilliant to see um, there are actually these are common dolphins and there are two species of common dolphin there's the short beak one which is a deeper water oceanic species and this is actually the one that we get in uh, British waters um, uh, that we just call the common dolphin and look how short its uh, snout is and it's got a kind face and then there's a one with a less kind face and a longer snout and this is the long beak common dolphin and this is the one that we commonly see it's more of a tropical species never recorded in Europe and it's found in the shallower coastal waters um, we also see lots of bottlenose dolphins, and these really are as acrobatic as you, uh, uh, you, you uh, as you can imagine. Look at this. They just sort of leap right out of the water and show off and spin round for you. Um, I took this picture of this one that just kept repeatedly leaping high above us on the boat. It must have been coming to, to a good 12 feet out of the, uh, uh, of the water, and everybody's just lined up taking photographs of it as it, uh, as it kept reappearing for us. Um, and uh, and they often follow the uh, the boat. Sometimes they ride alongside. Sometimes they bow wave. But it's uh, you know the photo opportunities of getting uh, the dolphins leaping out of the water in perfect sunlight is uh, is is just fantastic. Um, there's uh, three at once all leaping out of the water. That, that is a, quite a, a, a feat there. And uh, there's a mother and baby leaping together. Uh, again, you see lots of things like that. And uh, this was quite interesting. So first of all, this was taken through the surface of the ocean. So this, um, this bottlenose dolphin was in the ocean. Now you can see it's got a remora fish there, one of these um, uh, uh, fish that just sort of attaches themselves. And it must be very annoying for the dolphin because it must really affect their uh, uh, hydrodynamics and get in the way but you can see that, um, uh, that another dolphin there with the teeth marks has been trying to get the remora off and no matter what they do they just lie flat and and they're, they're a bit sort of slimy so the dolphins can't get rid of them so but you can see it's tried there now there's a, a one of the theories is that the really energetic dolphins that really leap out of the water and spin are trying to actually get rid of these remora fish and uh, there's a, a picture of one that I managed to take you can just see that huge remora fish on the side and the dolphin that's leaping the highest is the one with the remora but when you just look at the dolphins uh, when it's clear water these are all off the front of the boat there's not a remora to be seen there so um, I think that there, there might be something in that theory but um, look at this this is all taken through the uh, mirror calm Pacific Ocean with um, it looks like an airbrush painting that doesn't it but those are all the uh, uh, common dolphins just uh, alongside our boat and that's uh, yeah one final shot of the common dolphins just leaping in unison alongside the boat but the, you know the, the opportunities like this have just come thick and fast on this trip um, our next venue is a place called San Ignacio Lagoon, and there's the boat with uh, uh, one of the crew members having a chat with a grey whale there. Now, San Ignacio Lagoon is, uh, is um, a, a, a coastal lagoon with uh, access to the Pacific Ocean, and all, almost all of the, um, uh, the, the world's grey whales travel down the, uh, uh, the, the Pacific coast of America and spend the winter in these lagoons and what they do here is they uh, they mate here and they give birth here that's why all the males come again to mate and the females come to give birth and the reason and then they go all the way back up to Alaska where they feed in the cold waters but the babies are born without any blubber so if they were born in the cold waters of the north they would die of cold whereas so that's why they come down to the warmer waters and um, and wherever you look you can just see whales blowing in San Ignacio Lagoon there's literally hundreds of them and um, they um, 
Uh, that's one of them spy hopping right next to our, our boat here. But and, and that's the thing. So it's 3000 miles from uh, the San Ignacio Lagoon up to the feeding grounds in Alaska and then 3000 miles back. And they're constantly on the move, just spending a few months in Alaska and usually a couple of months down in Baja. And the rest of the time it's in transit on migration. And it's the largest migration of, uh, of any known mammal on the planet. The, um, and there, they, uh, the, the really good thing about this population of whales is that they like attention. They, they, if you go in a boat, they come up to the boat to see what's going on and look at the joy on people's faces as the, uh, a huge great whale just leaps out of the, comes out of the water to say hello. And the youngsters are incredibly uh, uh, friendly. This is a young one that hasn't got any of the barnacles and things on it yet, but it, it comes up to uh, one side of the boat to be stroked. And look at this next picture picture and uh, tell me that these um, uh, this whale isn't enjoying it. Look, it's like a, a cat or a dog being stroked, isn't it? It's just closing its eyes and relishing the moment there. So uh, this habit only started in 1976 and uh, the people who discovered it were thinking, oh no, you know, we're, we're interfering with the whale's behaviour and they tried to move away and the whales just kept following and then others started to join in and now it's a really common thing and um, some people have it on their bucket list that they'd like to kill a whale and that's indeed what this young lady is doing is that uh, she sort of uh, uh, let, leaned over and kissed the whale um, that's another picture of the uh, another boat with the whales in, in between the whales come to you as well we don't really have to go seeking out the whales and this one was after a tongue scratch it opened its mouth and let me put my hand in and scratch its tongue and when it closed its mouth it accidentally just caught my arm a little bit and it opened it up as if oh I'm sorry I didn't mean to hurt you you know they're so gentle and, and soft when you touch them as well it, it, you think that it would be like a hard tire uh, from a car but it's not it's like a balloon with water they're really soft and squidgy and there's one just in the under the surface of the lagoon just sort of uh, watching and waiting for a bit of attention here so and I took this picture at night because the whales are active all night and you can feel them rubbing themselves against the rope the anchor ropes of the boat and things like that and that was just a random flash photograph that ended up catching I think there's three whales in view uh, in that one picture there and that's another picture I went to the top and looked down and there's just a whale just alongside of the boat but this happens all the time. Uh, all around the edge of San Ignacio Lagoon, there's some mangroves, and uh, we sometimes have a, a break from the whales and go and have a look at the wildlife in the mangroves. Absolutely full of the herons, all the kind of things that you see in Florida, and uh, you know, there's herons and waders, uh, things like reddish egrets and uh, black crowned night heron, yellow crowned night heron, lots of other species as well, and willets and uh, uh, yellow legs and dowichers, marble godwits, long bill curlews. It's uh, really, really good for birds in those mangroves. You also get mangrove warbler as well, which is a one to see, and loads of royal terns down there. These are the American royal terns, which have been split from the African ones, but uh, again, super abundance of those. And you get Caspian terns as well, lots of and elegant terns as well. Leaving uh, San Ignacio Lagoon and heading south, this is a shrimp boat. And look at all those birds around it. And look, they're all actually lined up on the uh, on the rigging. And those are all frigate birds. And the reason why they line up on there is because they can't land on water because they don't have web feet. So if they landed on the water, they can't get the purchase to get uh, airborne again. So what they do is they land on boats. And this is even our little boat. And you can see frigate birds lined up there. Again, the the, uh, the owners don't usually like them doing this because they defecate all over the boat you see so they try and scare them off but they just come back and uh, there's one a male there with the great uh, throat pouch because they're not on a breeding ground they're not inflating that but you can certainly see the throat pouch there other birds that you see when you start getting to warmer water, this is a masked booby. Um, uh, they're quite scarce birds, but we usually see, you know, two or three of them when we go down. Uh, Red-billed tropic bird, another scarce bird, but again, I've never failed to find them there down there. And uh, we also see turtles, plenty of turtles, usually green turtle and uh, loggerhead, but I have seen Kent Ridleys down there as well. And uh, sometimes they sort of just fall asleep at the surface and we can sneak up on them and get them very close. But they're a little bit shy because I think people have, uh, have taken them for turtle soups and things like that. 
So uh, this is the largest bony fish in the world. This is the ocean sunfish. Its scientific name is Mola Mola, and Mola is the Latin word for uh, a grinding stone, one of those flat stones that you sharpen blades on. So um, these things can be as big as a dustbin lid, even bigger than that, and just sort of lie at the surface there, gazing at the sun. That's where they get the name sunfish there. Sometimes you get terns landing on them, just sitting on them, and uh, they also let birds come and peck the uh, parasites off them. Then we head down to the southern tip of Baja, and this is where all the humpback whales breed. And uh, because they're breeding there, they're all getting excited and doing interesting things. And uh, this was just diving right by the boat. That's actually the back of my head. Somebody else took this photograph, but it was just quite dramatic with the whale there in focus and my head sort of uh, looking at it straight, straight away there. So uh, when I said they do interesting things, sometimes they lay on the back and what we call flipper flop. They just sort of whack their pectoral fins on the surface of the water. Uh, they do tail splashes like this. Uh, that was down at the bottom of Baja. Um, sometimes they, it, it's like doing the butterfly stroke at the surface. They make huge wheezing noises and they go and they, uh, this, they, they paddle. You can see the pectoral fins out there as they're paddling across the surface, but huge great males competing for the females here. And of course they breach as well. It's a great place to see breaching uh, uh, back whales. And again, I've, I've taken many, many photographs of, you know, very dramatic uh, breaches like this. This is another one that everybody wants to get the, uh, the photograph of. Then we head round the corner into the Sea of Cortez. And this is a nice, uh, uh, usually very, very calm and nice weather. And we visit uh, several of the islands in here. Um, there's a, uh, we usually see these spiny tail mobulars here, which are actually a kind of, uh, of manta ray. And what they do is sometimes for no apparent reason, they leap out of the water and then just splat down. And the noise seems to set everything off. And it's like a chain reaction. One starts and then a few go. And then all of a sudden there's dozens of them going up and down all over the place. Um, there's a picture of two of them simultaneously just leaping out of the water. And they, they make sure that they're absolutely flat to make the maximum noise to splat on the water there. That's a great thing to witness. Uh, we see various species of sharks. I've seen thresher shark, mako shark, uh, hammerhead shark, and we also um, uh, go and swim with uh, whale sharks down in the Sea of Cortez as well. So uh, as long as the weather's um, um, calm enough for us to get into the water, we can go and swim with whale sharks. There's a small population of them down there where uh, the captain knows where they are. Uh, on the islands, various interested birds like Roadrunner actually doing its running there and more familiar birds from North America like Cardinal, but also its rarer cousin, which is the Pyroloxia. I put the scientific name on the bottom there because uh, those of you that know about scientific names will see that that's a, 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 a combination of bullfinch, Pyrula and Loxia, which is crossbill. So if, essentially its Latin name means bullfinch crossbill. And I think that's quite a, an appropriate name when you see that funny little beak on it. Um, I managed to get both of the orioles that you see down there in uh, together. The, uh, uh, the top one is uh, Scott's oriole, the big yellow rump, and the uh, orange one below is uh, hooded oriole. Uh, there. Uh, there's Costa's hummingbird and there's also an endemic hummingbird that only occurs on Baja Peninsula and that's Zantu's hummingbird, uh, this one with the red and black beak and the white eye stripe. But again, we see that uh, usually several places. Uh, this is one of the, uh, uh, the, the rock formations in the Sea of Cortez, and here there's a colony of uh, sea lions, but also a breeding colony of uh, various boobies. Uh, this is blue-footed booby that breeds there, and uh, brown booby as well, but, um, and uh, the ubiquitous brown pelican as well. But um, the, uh, there's also an opportunity to go swimming with sea lions here, which is uh, uh, really exciting, actually. And at once when I, I, I took these pictures with a really cheap underwater camera and when I was under watching the sea lions I thought oh somebody's chucked a football in and they found this uh, football that they're playing in and they were passing it from one to the other and playing around with this football then when I got a bit closer I realized it wasn't a football it was a guinea fowl puffer fish that had inflated itself to try and protect itself and the uh, the sea lions were just playing with it and uh, when the, play the sea lions left it alone this is a very disgruntled looking uh, guinea fowl puffer fish here 
Um, again, I, uh, we always get an opportunity to see the phosphorescent uh, uh, plankton as well, uh, the bioluminescence. Um, when it's a really dark night with no moon, he, he drives around in the dark and the, the, the engine and the, the pitch of the engine attracts dolphins to come and bow ride. And it's the most amazing thing. I actually contrived this on Photoshop to try and show what it's like because it's so difficult to photograph with those light conditions. But basically the dolphins glow in the dark. You can see them underwater as they move through and, and, and uh, agitate the plankton, which then flash and, and, and light it up. But then they leap out of the water and they vanish completely. It's completely black. And then they go down into the water again and reappear. But that really is, of all the great wildlife experiences I've had, bioluminescent dolphins is right up there at the top. Um, also in the Sea of Cortez, we sometimes see sperm whales. And, uh, and again, we've been lucky. This is one spy hopping. That's the, uh, the mouth below. But sometimes we've been lucky enough to see them uh, breaching. And you see that great big sort of bulbous head on there. And uh, look at that. These are all breaching sperm whales and then splash into the water. Really exciting stuff. And also we usually see, um, well, more often than sperm whales, actually, but the rare dwarf sperm whale, these ones that you see in whale books, but you very rarely see in real life. And there they are floating at the surface. But again, that's usually fairly guaranteeable on this trip. And um, this is Brooder's whale. It's spelled bride's whale, but pronounced Brooder's. It's a rare tropical whale. And it has these three ridges down the front of its uh, rostrum, the snout. And you can just about see them there, but it's a, you know, it's, it's just a, a nice whale to see. But the one that everybody wants to see is the biggest whale animal that's ever lived on the planet, up to 34 meters long and weighing up to 190 tons. This is the blue whale. And again, we always see lots of blue whales, not just in the Sea of Cortez, sometimes on the outside, as well. So uh, this is a mother uh, and uh, a baby. And the reason why she's looking thin, you can see her vertebra there, is because she's still uh, um, suckling the youngster. So that uses up all her fat reserves. So the youngster has a, a, a big fat body and she's got a, a thin body, but she's looking after the, uh, the youngster there. And when a blue whale has been diving, the first, uh, the first blow that it does when it comes up can be up to 10 meters tall, really, really massive. And uh, uh, But then after that, the subsequent blows are usually smaller, but I managed to catch the big 10 meter blow there. And uh, the, uh, they have a sonar on the boat that enables them to see the whales underwater. And you can see this one, the depth is 84.5 fathoms. That's, a, that's a, a ball of krill above it. And you can see the whale shape there underneath. But what he does is it's a, the, the captain then knows exactly where the whale's going to appear. And he can position the boat and he'll say, yeah, it's coming up any minute now. And up the whale comes and uh, there's a blue whale with uh, uh, people enjoying it right alongside. And uh, there's about 3,000 in the Eastern Pacific, which is uh, about a third of the entire global population of blue whales. So probably the best place on the planet to see blue whales. I tried to do a, an extreme wide angle here to make the largest animal that's ever lived on the planet look small on the planet. And uh, that's what I was doing there, just experimenting a bit. And they don't all fluke, uh, show their tails when they dive. But when we find one that does, the captain often follows it and gets the right angle so that you can get the... Uh, 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 all the photographs you want. You can see that tiny little uh, uh, dorsal fin at the uh, on the back there and the huge great tail fluke. And uh, it's traditional to end on sunset. This is a blue whale going down in the sunset. And uh, when you've taken a blue whale in the sunset, you have to show them. And here's another one just about to go down as the sun's going down. And the absolute final one is a little green flash. We get lots of opportunity to see the green flash when the sun finally sets. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tim. I'm so glad we got you on time for that. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> um, over to Alison next, who's going to be taking us to Indonesia. Okay, okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, nice for you to join us this evening. Um, I'll just wait for Tim to, to finish sharing his screen until I can share mine instead. Um, Done. Okay, um, so um, I'm one of the operations managers at Nature Track. I've been working there for around about seven years now, and I've been very fortunate enough to be able to head out on a number of trips. Um, so the two trips I'm going to be talking to you about this evening are our two Indonesia cruises, uh, Bali to Komodo and Raja Ampat. Um, and I have had the privilege of being able to go out on both of these trips um, over the last uh, few years. 
Um, so Indonesia is a very large country. Um, it spans over 3,000 miles, which is about 5,000 kilometres, um, and that's about an eighth of the world's kind of circumference round. So it really does take up uh, quite a lot of space in the world. Um, and it's made up of over 17,000 different islands. So it's an awful lot of places to be able to visit. Um, so if you start down in towards the, 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 the west of this map, you'll see uh, Bali right down in the bottom corner there. Um, and then over on the, um, on the east of the country, you'll see um, the, the bird's head of West Papua, which is where um, Raja Ampat is. So I'll start with our Bali to Komodo trip. Um, as the name suggests, uh, one of the things that many people want to see on this trip is the Komodo dragons. Um, but there's so much more to this trip as well. And um, there are many, many things to see um, other than just the, the dragons. But at the start of the trip, we fly into, into Bali, into Denpasar Airport. And we often run um, either a pre or post tour extension to Bali Barat National Park. Um, but there's many options for um, people to extend um, different um, parts of Indonesia um, or Bali itself, um, either before or after the main tour as well. Generally, we tend to overnight there. Um, and then we get on the boat and we head um, across uh, Wallace's line uh, to the east um, and then coming up the, the northern shore of Lombok um, and Sumbawa um, over towards uh, Komodo and Rincha. Um, sometimes we run the trip as a one-way trip and we finish at Maimir, uh, which is right towards the, the, the um, east of this map. And then other times we'll come uh, round towards uh, Komodo and Rincha um, and then um, make our way back towards Bali again, uh, depending on uh, the, the boat schedule that we have. So a little bit about uh, the extension that we do. Uh, Bali Barat National Park is up in the northwest of Bali, um, and we stay at the lovely Minjangan Resort. Um, some of the key species that we'll want to see up here is the Bali starling. Um, it's one of the few remaining populations that there are, um, but there's plenty of other species to be seen as well, such as the coppersmith barbet and collared kingfisher. There's also a, a nice covered tower that overlooks the forest. Great place to look out and a wonderful way to finish the day uh, with perhaps some pre-dinner drinks. For those people who are flying into Denpasar, um, we always have an overnight there and we generally find a local hotel that's got some lovely grounds that we can um, relax in um, and enjoy the beach from as well. We can find quite a bit of wildlife here too. Um, it's quite a lot of garden area um, and the little javan munia that you can see in the uh, top right um, quite often comes down to feed on the seed head type things. Um, and you'll often hear the um, yellow crested cockatoos around the trees um, and they'll often have a nest hole in one of those as well. Our home for the time when we're on, on board the boat um, is uh, one of two sister ships, but um, normally the Mermaid One. Uh, they've both got a very similar setup. Um, this particular boat is a 28 metre twin engine vessel. It's got um, eight cabins for, um, for guests. Um, so there's generally um, 13 um, in the group plus two leaders, uh, one of whom is Chaz Anderson, um, who is a renowned uh, marine biologist. Once we get on board the boat, uh, we leave the port and we start seeing various uh, seabirds um, as we go, um, often terns, um, such as this greater crested tern, um, and perhaps some more pelagic species, uh, such as the, the bulwars petrel. It's most likely that we'll cross the Lombok Strait overnight. Um, we might start picking up some cetaceans just out of Bali, but it's likely to be the following morning we'll start seeing those. Um, and quite often we'll come across uh, the energetic uh, spinner dolphins. If they're in a playful mood, uh, they'll quite often come and buy ride on the boat and allow us to have a fantastic, really close view of them. They're often in fairly large groups, um, and these are dolphins that are known for their acrobatics. Quite often they'll be able to uh, jump out the water and sometimes spin um, several uh, full spins round um, in the same jump. Um, and as Tim said, one of the reasons that they think people, they do this, um, because it's very energy expensive for them, um, is to try and get rid of uh, pests like the remora um, that um, can often be seen on them. Um, spinning dolphins, um, it's been shown that at least 40% of them have been known to have remora on them. So that's one of the reasons they think they do it. Um, Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins are also possible, um, as are the lovely um, pantropical spotted dolphins as well. So generally on a typical day, uh, we'll have a, a morning snorkel um, or perhaps an island visit. 
After that, we'll head out into the deeper water to do some cetacean watching and also look out for various seabirds as we go. And then head back into towards the, the, the um, shallower waters in the afternoon, um, either for another snorkel um, or for um, another island visit again. As well as the, the mammals and birds that we're seeing um, um, above the water, there's plenty of life uh, below the waves as well. In Indonesia sits within the Coral Triangle, which means it's one of the most marine diverse areas in the world. Um, and there's thousands of fish species here, literally thousands of fish species. Um, so it takes a little while to get your eye in and to work out what you're seeing. Um, some of the species that we quite frequently see are the freckled hawkfish, um, the one in the top left. Um, it's also called a forester's or black-sided um, hawkfish, depending which part of the world you're in. And they quite often sit um, on a bit of coral like a hawk would in a tree. Um, if the light's right, you can get a lot of colour on some of the fish. Um, and the blue-girdled blue -girdled angelfish is one of the very nice ones uh, to be able to see. We can also find uh, quite a few different eels um, and this white mouthed murray uh, was showing itself quite nicely uh, coming out of a hole uh, but other times all you'll see of them is the, just the, the front of their mouth as they're gulping um, water in to pass um, air over their um, gill regions. And some of the little, little species you'll see um, are nudibranchs or sea slugs. Uh, one morning we might visit the island of Satonda. Um, this is a volcanic crater lake um, it's got um, very saline water um, pe and people aren't exactly sure uh, why um, it's so, uh, so salty in there uh, when typically you'd find an inland uh, fr uh, lake being freshwater. Um, there's a lot of theories about it but no one actually knows for sure. Heading out each day, we'll be um, cruising and looking out for cetaceans. Um, and sometimes we come across pods of whales logging on the surface, uh, such as these melon headed whales. Um, so as the name suggests, they've got fairly rounded heads um, and they're often um, going to be um, spending part of their day um, conserving energy and, and having a bit of a rest on the surface of the water. Some of the seabirds that we might find um, are phalaropes again here, again red-necked phalarope in their winter plumage, um, not often in such big flocks here, um, so it can be a little bit tricky to pick out uh, through the waves, um, but a bit of a flutter of motion uh, will sometimes give away their position. Um, or perhaps some of the flots I'm floating past will have uh, various turns um, perched on them, uh, such as these bridled turns. Heading on to an afternoon snorkel, um, it's not always going to be on what we consider a typical reef. Uh, sometimes we're finding um, a wall that's got um, soft corals, sea fans and sponges growing along it. Um, these can often be um, nice and brightly coloured um, just because of the way the, um, uh, the, the different creatures uh, utilise the, the space. Along with fish, uh, we might find some different types of um, species as well, and um, perhaps uh, individual or uh, groups of squid. Uh, there quite often be sharks, such as this white-tipped reef shark. They got the first surprise when it came out of a gap in the coral and found all of us uh, floating above it. Um, there's turtles here, mainly green turtles or hawksbill turtles, um, and quite a number of rays as well, um, including the, the large manta rays, uh, which is always a favourite for people to see as well. One morning we'll obviously visit uh, Komodo National Park, uh, the home of the largest living lizard. These grow up to three metres in length or 10 feet, weighing in at up to 166 kilograms or 366 pounds uh, for the larger males. Um, so we definitely need to treat them with respect, um, particularly since their, um, their saliva is venomous. Um, so we always are escorted by a ranger while we're here uh, to make sure that we are staying safe. There's lots of other things to see along the islands as well um, while, we're, while we're there. Um, and as we walk around, we'll be looking out for um, species such as a flame-breasted sunbird um, or perhaps a black-necked oreo, uh, both of which can sometimes be higher up in the trees, uh, but the flashes of colour you get from them uh, give away where they are. Um, the Komodo orchid uh, will also provide a, a bit of a splash of colour um, and might be um, found within um, a tree branch area um, where we are uh, as we're walking along the paths. Scratching noises from the side uh, might indicate the presence of orange-footed scrub fowl. 
Um, and in the evenings, uh, we might perhaps take one of the rib boats uh, from the um, from the big vessel we're travelling on um, and head along the shoreline, looking out for wildlife there, um, including Komodo dragons, which will quite often come down to bask on the beach, um, per but perhaps um, monkeys or um, wild pigs as well. Rinch is another island which is nearby and sometimes we'll also visit at the Komodo dragons as well and perhaps a chance to take a walk around. And the scenery is also pretty fantastic. Um, it's mainly volcanic um, so you can see um, a very different type of um, look to landscapes uh, than you get in other places. Um, many of the volcanoes are in varying stages, some are extinct, uh, some are dormant and, and some are still uh, relatively active. As we head along the open waters, we'll be carrying on looking for more cetacean species um, and the other dolphins we might find in this region are Fraser's dolphin or perhaps Rissu's dolphin. These range in colour from dark grey for the, the, the younger ones and the females up to almost pure white uh, for the males, um, particularly where they've been uh, fighting and creating scratches and scars um, along their bodies. We'll also be looking out for larger species of cetacean too, um, including some of the baleen whales. Um, and the, uh, the way we go um, along for this cruise um, is happens to be on the um, migration route uh, for blue whales. At this time of year, they're often heading from the Banda Sea down towards Australia um, and coming around through the channels between the islands here is one of the ways that they go. Some evenings, if we're near the shore, we might potentially see some fruit bats um, heading out for their evening foraging. Uh, some roosts are in very, very large numbers um, and it can be very spectacular to see and hear them as they travel overhead. And as was Tim was saying, you often get spectacular sunsets uh, when you're out at sea, um, but spectacular sunsets do mark the end of each day and also mark the end of our time there. Where everyone is often getting off the boat wishing they could stay a lot longer and wondering where on earth the last few days have gone to. Heading a bit further to the east, um, on the opposite side of the archipelago, we've got um, Raja Ampat. Um, this translates to the Four Kings, um, which indicates the four main islands which make up this part of the country. Uh, so for this trip we board the, the boat in Sarong. It's usually the same boat or the sister boat again um, and the um, Exact itinerary here is kept a little bit more flexible uh, to make um, uh, allow us to, to make the most of the weather um, as well as the sightings that we've had. Although the general make of the days is very similar to how we um, run the ballet trips as well. Heading out to Sarong, uh, we'll perhaps start seeing spinner dolphins again. Um, and these ones, uh, you may perhaps uh, start seeing um, little wounds along some of the dolphins here. Um, and these are caused by a particular type of shark called a cookie cutter shark. Um, as you can see from quite, the name comes from the quite neat type circle um, that's along there, but not very pleasant uh, for the dolphins that have been um, the victim of it. Here we do lots of different types of snorkeling. Um, some of the corals can be a bit different to get in, in other areas, um, often quite large uh, plate corals, um, making up the different types of reef um, and very large coral gardens. Um, again, there'll be lots of colorful fish um, like these uh, sergeants um, and uh, soldier fish. Um, some of the fish that you start seeing might be familiar to you, um, um, such as the um, clown fish or anemone fish, um, often um, keeping, um, keeping the territories and making sure that no one um, takes over their, their, their home space. One morning we'll have a very, very early start, um, heading up to the ridge of a nearby island um, in time to see a bird of paradise lek, um, particularly the red bird of paradise, where we're hoping that the males will be coming in that morning to display um, and show off their long tail feathers and colourful pl plumage. A little bit further along the road, there's a different lek as well um, for a Wilson's bird of paradise. So we're generally able to fit both of those into the same morning um, and if we're if we're fortunate enough they'll both be um, at their lecking sites. As we're on the island uh, we'll also be seeing uh, pigeons and doves, cockatoos, butcher birds, parrots and friar birds. Once we're back on the boat some of the birds that we might be seeing are um, frigate birds a little bit like Tim was mentioning we get both greater and lesser frigate birds um, in this area. Um, but one of the things we're hoping to see as we're heading back out is the, the baleen whales. 
On the last trip we did here, we had two main species that we were, we were looking at. Um, the Amuras whale. Um, this particular species is only recognised as a separate species within the last 20 years, which for, which for a 12 metre animal um, is something that's quite amazing. We also get a breeder's whale here, um, and as Tim was saying, it's got a third rostral ridge, if you can get close enough uh, to be able to see that. It's very similar in size and shape to Amuras, um, but you need some subtle differences uh, within there. Um, I'm hoping I'll be able to share a short video with you um, of our whale watching experiences out there. Um, there's something quite amazing about um, being able to work out where and, and, the, and the anticipation of the whales coming up um, in just the right place to, to watch them and being able to share those few moments with them um, before they go back down to the depths again. So please excuse the background noise, um, it's just what was going on um, at the time when we were there. Um, so that was a pair of Amura's whale that we were very fortunate to see. Um, again, we think it was a, a mother and calf coming up together since they were travelling so closely uh, side by side. Once we spent um, the, the most of the afternoon um, out in the deeper waters, we'll be heading back into shallower waters for a snorkel again. Um, and there's a possibility of uh, some mangrove uh, visits while we're on this particular trip. Um, these have a very different atmosphere to, uh, to a, a full on coral reef. Um, and you'll often get fish hiding within the tree roots um, and just creating um, a, a very different uh, feel to, to the visit. Um, again, there's walls um, around this area where we might find uh, lots of soft coral growth um, and sponges. These can be very, very colourful, um, a lot of different um, pigmentation in them compared to some of the, the hard corals. Um, and particularly if it's near the surface, uh, like this soft coral on a pier post, um, they can be very, very um, intense in colour indeed. We might also get a few surprises. Um, this sea snake certainly surprised me as it swam towards me um, at one particular point. Um, this is a banded sea crate. Um, and then um, this particular um, place as well, we also had uh, quite a lot of nudibranchs um, along in very um, varying different types of colours. Um, nudibranchs are sea slugs and their name means naked gill um, and they, uh, this refers to the breathing apparatus outside their body uh, which you can see in sort of feathery type structures um, on these uh, different individuals. Uh, also get a few other interesting things um, as we head around. Uh, this is a star puffer fish um, and there are matte puffer fish in the area as well. Um, not quite a round ball as, as the, um, um, the, 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 the guinea fowl puffer fish that, that Tim had, but definitely uh, big and puffed up nonetheless. Uh, rays, um, including um, manta rays, um, but varying types of stingray as well, um, can be seen uh, during this trip, such as this uh, white-tailed stingray here. Um, and also sharks. Um, this black tip reef shark, uh, there was a few of them this day, and they were particularly interested in something on the back of our boat. Um, but you can also get a few more interesting ones, um, such as this uh, tasseled wobegong, uh, which is a type of carpet shark. Again, some wonderful scenery to be seen as we head around, um, some amazing um, geological features um, on the different islands um, and some fantastic um, coloration as the, we go from the, the bright green vegetation on shore to the sort of turquoisey uh, waters near the, near the sandy, sandy um, beaches and um, right through to the, the, the deep blue water um, of, the, uh, of the sort of um, deeper ocean areas. So um, really spectacular scenery to be seen there as well. Um, and again, finishing on a lovely sunset, it's a beautiful coloration we get there. Um, and if you're very fortunate, you might get some dolphins playing through the sunset um, as well. Um, so just really quickly, um, 
few dates for uh, 2024 for both of these trips um, and also a quick plug and um, we've got a very similar trip that we're going to be running in 25 to the Solomon Islands um, uh, information to follow shortly um, so if you're interested please uh, do register interest in that um, and thank you very much please let me know if you've got any questions. Thank you very much, Alison. I particularly enjoyed the tassel will be going at the end, a favourite. Um, we are just going to pause for five minutes now. We're running a little bit behind schedule. Um, so we'll just, yeah, sort of five minutes, um, go and top up your glasses, get a quick snack, whatever you need to do. Um, and we'll see you shortly to head to the Galapagos and Western Canada.
Sorry to cut that off so abruptly. He's just getting going there, wasn't he? Um, thanks for coming back after the break. And I will hand you over to Andy to take us to the Africa. Say with you, Andy. Thanks very much, Kerry. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good to be back with you on one of these webinars. I'm talking from just outside Basingstoke this evening, about 20 minutes from the Nature Oak office. And we're right in the thick of the Galapagos season at the moment. In fact, I've had a group fly from Quito to Galapagos today. And sorry to be rude, but I'd rather be with them than sitting here talking to you all, because uh, it's been a few years since I've been over there. And it's such a, a wonderful, iconic destination. It's one of those places that lives so long in the memory once you've been there. And I know for many of you, it'll be one of these kind of uh, once in a lifetime destination. So I hope I bring back some memories for those of you that have been there in the past uh, and help maybe to answer some common questions I get for those of you perhaps planning uh, a trip there in the future. So let's just get our bearings first of all. Here's Ecuador, this green nation on the western seaboard of the South American continent. And on this scale, uh, Galapagos, 1,500 kilometres or so out west in the Pacific Ocean, straddling the equator. Uh, so on the scale here, basically on the edge of my computer monitor, depends what screen you're viewing this on. But to get to Galapagos, we fly into the Ecuadorian capital of Quito, usually with KLM via Amsterdam. There are no direct flights and KLM have the advantage of regional departures from around the UK. And we have a day in Ecuador just to catch our breath, let our body clocks adjust and importantly, give a chance for any lost baggage to catch up. Because believe me, reuniting someone with a lost suitcase who's bobbing around in the middle of the Pacific uh, is a headache we'd rather not have. So heading out to Galapagos, here's the equator, just towards the top of the screen here, bisecting the northern portion of Isabella, the largest of the Galapagos Islands. Uh, so down here in the southeast, we've got the oldest ge geologically of the islands, Española, Floriana and San Cristobal. We think these are about 90 million years old. That's when they first surfaced above the waves of the Pacific. And over here in the west, we've got the newest geologically of the Galapagos Islands. And these two islands, Fernandina and Isabella, are still very much uh, active volcanically. And if you're lucky, you might see some activity while you're over there, although you don't want too much activity because there'll be a no-go zone. Uh, we offer one-week cruises and two-week cruises. A two-week format is the most popular for those with the time and the money because in two weeks, 14 nights on board, you get to get around to all of the main visitor sites, usually in a figure of eight shape. Whereas if you do just seven nights, which most visitors do, or in fact, even less in many cases, you only get to see one portion of the islands. And I just think that's a shame. If you fall in love with the islands like most visitors do, uh, you'll be kicking yourself after seven nights. You'll be tearing yourself away, thinking, why didn't I stay on and see the other half of the archipelago? So this is a view that my group have had today, flying into Baltra. Uh, you get this impression of kind of rather barren, low-lying islands when you're flying on the 737. But uh, once you're on shore, the riches of the Galapagos uh, come to life and uh, you're generally beguiled and bewitched. Now, my advice, uh, whether you go with Nature Trek or, or some other tour operator, choose your boat very carefully. Um, I favour smaller boats, so up to 16 berths. I think these kinds of boats, you, you get a, a good family type atmosphere on board. You can guarantee a high quality of guide and you can be assured, especially if you come on a charter like the ones we operate, that you get like minded clients on board and you're not with young families or people with barely a passing interest in wildlife. I think a destination like this, Galapagos, lends itself to a private small charter with like-minded passengers. So Cachalotti Explorer is one of the two boats we use. Good deck space, lovely crew, good food. Uh, I have to say the cabins are tight for space, a bit like in Baja, as Tim mentioned earlier. You can barely swing a cat, but I try not to focus on this and get clients to realise that you're only literally down here to wash and brush up and sleep. Uh, during daylight, as you're up on deck looking for seabirds and cetaceans. So the tight space isn't too problematic, especially if you plan carefully and have the right expectations. Uh, Beluga, Cachalotti Explorer, sister ship, the same owners in Ecuador. So I get the same quality of service and guiding on board. Uh, Beluga is uh, a bit bigger, a bit more powerful, and the cabins are a bit bigger too. You generally get two lower berths rather than the bunk beds on Cachalotti Explorer. Expect to pay about a thousand pounds extra 
for that privileged per person. But both fantastic boats, good itineraries, and importantly, we have the very high quality of service and guiding on board. Now, to get from your parent ship onto dry land in Galapagos, you will decamp onto these zodiacs or pangas, as they're called in Galapagos, P-A-N-G-A. And uh, the seamen take us ashore, and then you disembark via a dry landing, stepping straight onto a wooden or stone jetty, or a wet landing where the zodiac is manoeuvred into the gently slope in Sandy Beach, and you kind of wiggle your backside off the edge of the pananga, uh, slip off into maybe knee deep or perhaps thigh deep sea water, uh, wade ashore, towel yourself down, and uh, put your shoes and socks on and go off on your wildlife hike. Uh, this is Jenny Wilshire, one of our tour leaders on the left here. We don't generally send uh, tour leaders to Galapagos. I, I led a ho whole series of tours here between 99 and about 2004. Uh, but the standard of guiding in Galapagos over the years has increased markedly. So it's no longer necessary for us to send a UK tour leader across uh, because we know the Ecuadorian leaders that we hire and work with have brilliant English. Their wildlife knowledge is exceptional. And uh, importantly, they're good companions as well. They can hold a conversation over the dinner table, understand the British psyche, and uh, they're generally just great travelling partners. The welcoming committee, as we head south, normally Española, uh, is one of our first ports of call, and cameras are clicking away as a Galapagos hawk, uh, similar to our buzzard, uh, might comprise the welcoming committee here. And on Española, one of my favourite islands, often the Hood Mockingbird, a small endemic, um, Bird here perched on this lady said, we'll come actually looking for uh, food and water. When uh, tourists first started visiting Galapagos in the 1970s, the ecological impact of people hadn't really been studied and people thought nothing of handing out a banana or a cap full of water. But of course, in such a fragile ecosystem, that kind of interference does have quite deep rooted effects on uh, indigenous and endemic wildlife. So that kind of behaviour has been stamped out by the National Park Authority, but the legacy seems to live on. These creatures still do, particularly in the form of mockingbirds, come down and, and look for freebies, a couple of marine iguanas uh, in the sun there behind. Uh, yellow warblers are ubiquitous around the Galapagos archipelago, particularly common in the intertidal area where they forage in the seaweed and uh, upper tidal line for small insects and detritus. Of particular interest to keen birders will be the 13 species of Darwin's finches. Uh, this is the large uh, ground finch. These were made famous by The Origin of the Species, published by Charles Darwin back in 1859. And the birds are actually quite difficult to identify. The plumage across the family is quite dull and uniform. So a knowledge of where or on what islands each species lives, and particularly the size and shape of the bill, gives away the identification of these birds, but they played a, a key part in Darwin's formulation of the theory of evolution. And once back in the UK, after that voyage on the Beagle in 1835, he published the seminal Origin of Species in 1859. And we'll learn about the Darwin story and the theories he developed during our cruise. And uh, we'll learn about lots of other things as well, because like on lots of nature holidays, we're not just focused on the wildlife, there'll be people in the party who are keen photographers. I can see from the comments, several keen photographers amongst you this evening. People are interested in Ecuadorian food, Chilean wine, the night sky, and the conversation over the dinner table in the evening on these kinds of cruises is always lively uh, and entertaining. Uh, Española has the largest species or subspecies of marine iguana in the archipelago. Um, the, the marine iguanas are particularly large and colorful. And we quickly get quite blasé, really, about the seabird colonies. We're literally picking our way over and around these nesting colonies of mast boobies or nasca boobies, as they're called now, uh, blue-footed boobies. And here we're looking out to sea for the red-billed tropic birds flying past. <clears throat> just the sight of that exposed flesh there just reminds me uh, some key advice, and that is if you head off in the British winter, like my group have today, it's very important to... Um, wear sun hats and a high fat of sun cream because it's tempting to gel off from wintry Europe, have some nice warm tropical sunshine and peel off. But under the equatorial sun, it shines bright and strong. And we've seen some quite severe cases of sunburn over the years. So just a word of warning. Back when I used to lead these tours 20 odd years ago, I remember people coming home with five or six carry bags full of rolled up film. Now, all of that's changed, of course, probably 15 years ago, we saw 
the digital photographic revolution take hold. And these days, our clients, it amazes me. I'm not really a photographer. I do take photos, but when I'm on a wildlife holiday, first and foremost, I like to watch and, and observe. And of course, as a, as a role as a tour leader, is for you to show and explain the wildlife, not take photos. But I'm amazed sometimes people take 15, 18,000 images on a two week cruise like this. Goodness knows when they get all the time to sort through them all. And I know from speaking to people, sometimes that time never comes. But some of the results these days from the camera equipment that people take uh, and their skills uh, are quite uh, breathtaking. Um, Mars boobies, sorry, Nazca boobies, uh, always very photogenic. And uh, the keen photographers in the party, always looking for that perfect portrait as we're walking through the breeding colony uh, on Española. The highlight of Española and arguably the Galapagos overall would be the waved albatrosses. This is an endemic bird to Ecuador. They only breed here and on a smaller island just off the coast of Ecuador called Isla de la Plata. And they're present from about May each year through to December. The rest of the year they spend on the Southern Ocean purely on the wing. So if you go to Galapagos now in February, they'll be absent. But if you go <coughs> in August, um, November, excuse me, <laughs> December, perhaps, oh, excuse me. Sometimes there's a few stragglers in uh, January as well. <clears throat> you will see this colony of waved albatross. Sorry, I've just uh, had something that's funny happened to my throat. So apologies, I sound a bit croaky now. Um, but yeah, this time of year, you walk past the waved albatrosses and you'll see the the beak clacking courtship display. And it's nice just to sit down in the foliage just with your own kind of private pair of albatross. And we can often spend 90 minutes or two hours here. And I'm often amazed when we see other groups just kind of walk past and take a cursory glance at the albatross uh, without really paying them any due attention. And again, that's the advantage of going with a wildlife orientated group that you can sit down, take your time, look for that perfect shot. And uh, above all, just enjoy the wonderful behavior of these birds, which have a, a three meter wingspan, uh, made for life and uh, quite magnificent creatures. We'll go to the cliff edge on Española and uh, see young birds uh, cruise past the cliff top here, along with red-billed tropic birds. On the south side of Española, one of the world's most beautiful beaches, um, Flamingo Beach, crystal clear blue seas and uh, uh, quite a large harem here of Galapagos sea lions, um, dominated by a beach master. You can see that mirage male in the background. So our guide will have a very keen eye on him. And if he gets at all aggressive, we will back off. But normally they're quite docile. And we'll take a snorkeling session here. Um, lovely clear water. The young sea lions are wonderful, playful partners in the water. And uh, actually snorkeling and swimming, uh, as in Indonesia, in Rajarampat, less so in Baja California, plays quite a big part in the cruise. There'll be opportunities to swim and snorkel uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, what we like to do early on during the cruise is just to do a gentle initiation session like this one on a gently slope in Sandy Beach where people can wade in and get used to the snorkeling apparatus without feeling too exposed or out of their depth. And then confidence builds as the week goes on. The water here, um, not as warm as where Alison was earlier in Indonesia. It's fairly chilly, depending on the time of the year, between about 19 and 22 degrees. So that's about the same as off the south coast of the UK in August. And I'm a bit of a worse, I'm afraid. Uh, when I see these people wild swimming and bathing in uh, in in ice capped lakes in the winter as if it's a sauna I kind of look at them thinking that's absolutely crazy I'd never do that so I, I dip my big toe in here I kind of recoil in horror uh, but at 19 20 21 degrees with a shorty wetsuit like Jenny's got on there cut off of the knees and elbows just a four mil shorty wetsuit picked up for 40 50 pounds from your local water sports center it will just keep you nice and snug and uh, I found mine was a very good investment when I was leading these stores there are also wetsuits and other equipment fins snorkels masks on board that you can borrow free of charge as well. But if at all possible, I'd encourage any visitor to get involved in the snorkeling, even if you have a fear of water, there's uh, buoyancy aids, local leisure centers here do initiation sessions. It's well worth it because the life underwater is, is fascinating, more so for me than actually the life on the islands. Um, and as I say, as confidence builds, we can take to the pangas and uh, do some snorkeling over deeper water reefs. 
the uh, the fish and wildlife we see here: hawksbill turtle, green turtles, pan tropical fish, fish which only live in eastern Pacific, and many fish also that are endemic to Galapagos. As I say, the water's not particularly warm, but it's bearable. It's absolutely fine. It's clear generally, and uh, the marine life is wonderful. So not the diversity of Indonesia, but um, wonderful close-up views. Uh, King angel fish here, surgeon fish in the background, um, some cold water corals, not tropical corals, and uh, often we can snorkel with Galapagos penguins, uh, different species of ray, white tip reef sharks. Um, it really is fascinating. Uh, away from the intertidal and marine ecosystem, one of my favourite days in Galapagos is the hike to Sierra Negra. This is in the southern half of Isabella, the large island to the west of the archipelago that I showed you on the map earlier. So we'll take a bus halfway up the mountain and uh, hike for the last kilometre or two to the crater rim. Uh, lovely views up here. If you're a geologist or a volcanologist, you'll see lots uh, here that you've studied in the past and read about it. Just it's a kind of an encyclopedia of, of volcanology up here. And our guide will be a keen geologist and we'll talk through all the different formations and the historic eruptions, etc. Uh, on the way up, we will see uh, land iguanas. This one just uh, halfway through is molt. And uh, provided wonderful uh, photographic opportunities. And over the last few years, it's been quite remarkable to see the transformation in these larger Galapagos islands. If I think about 20 years ago, uh, introduced goats, pigs and donkeys were rampant on these islands and would devour all of the endemic and indigenous vegetation to the great detriment of the land iguanas and the giant tortoises. But through some pretty nifty skills, <clears throat> um, they've managed to eradicate all of the large pests from the major Galapagos Islands. And the vegetation has regenerated as a result and the land iguanas and giant tortoises are thriving. Um, around the coast again, we will do a mixture of walks and uh, panga rides through the mangrove swamps. This is on the western side of Isabella. Uh, the guides and seamen with us are great company. Um, and we'll look for um, blue-footed boobies on top of the rock there. Just down to the bottom left, you can see two Galapagos penguins facing us. And just further to the bottom left still, those Sally Life who grabs uh, on the rocks there. And just those same two penguins close up closely related to Humboldt penguins, which are common in children's zoos around the UK, but these are endemic to the Galapagos Islands. And you'll see those Sally life of crabs there um, everywhere you go. Uh, another question I often get on Galapagos is how fit do I need to be to enjoy a cruise and the daily excursions? And I include this slide just to give you an idea of how quite difficult and uh, complex the underfoot terrain is sometimes. This is on the 1954 lava flow on Santiago Island, the guide in front there. And you can see the terrain is quite tricky. Uh, so you need, um, I wouldn't say so much uh, kind of aerobic fitness to enjoy a trip like this, but you do need a certain level of dexterity and nimbleness. And um, although you can't see it with any of those participants, often a walking pole or two uh, is a good idea just to keep you balanced because this rock, this volcanic rock is quite abrasive. So if you fall down, um, it can lead to some quite serious cuts and abrasions. So the, the name of the game is to walk slowly and carefully. The, the pace is never fast. The distances are never great. Uh, but do understand that getting from the panga onto the beach or the, or the dry jetty and this volcanic substrate that we walk over is quite tricky. Uh, so it's a, a very difficult undertaking for anybody with, with quite severe mobility difficulties. Uh, the deep water channel between Isabel and Fernandina is our best bet if we are to see any large cetaceans, and I'm not going to include any images. Um, you've had plenty of those from Tim and Alison, but if we are to see a say whale or a brooder's whale or even a pod of orcas, uh, then this is a, a good place on the western side of Isabella to see them. Lots of brown noddies here and Galapagos petrels and shearwaters. Uh, if you like your seabirds, you'll, you'll love the daytime spent up on deck. And um, we're en route here to another of my favourite visitor sites in Galapagos. This is Fernandina. So once again, the newest and most active geologically of all of the Galapagos Islands. And relatively few boats come round here. Uh, and what we do is it's not a particularly long walk, this one, but we, we disembark and we find ourselves in the midst of this enormous marine iguana colony. Often we're the only ones here. And it's kind of like a primeval 
atmosphere. You've got the breeze of the Pacific whistling through the air. Um, you've got these bizarre creatures, which Darwin and his crew members on Beagle didn't quite know what to make of. Uh, just protect your camera equipment here because they do have the habit of uh, sneezing a load of seat water and, and phlegm over your optics. So just be careful. But it's just a, a, a wonderful experience to nestle down in the midst of the colony here uh, for an hour or so and just soak up this, this atmosphere on this remote volcanic island. Just uh, a close up of the marine iguana. Another one of those iconic species. Endemic to Galapagos, presuming, presumably descended from the neotropical cormorant from the South American mainland. But in the absence of any predators over millennia, uh, this bird has presumably lost, simply lost the ability to fly. So the flightless cormorant, well named flightless cormorant, the Galapagos endemic, and the western side of the archipelago, Fernandinda Punta Espinosa, is a very good place to see them. Right here, we're back in the central part of the Galapagos, Santa Cruz, which is the, the circular island, which uh, is home to the largest town in Galapagos, Puerto Aora, uh, which is home to about 20,000 people. When we come up here, again, a day away from the intertidal zone, up to these sinkholes, or they're called in Spanish Los Gemelos, the, the twin, twin sinkholes. And we come up to see the giant tortoises, learn more about the volcanic landscape, see this endemic Scalacia forest, Look for the endemic uh, woodpecker finch, one of the um, one of Charles's Charles Darwin's uh, finches, and we'll have a, a lovely roast chicken lunch uh, up at a hacienda in the Highlands. Uh, our driver will take good care going along the road here, just in case a giant tortoise happens to cross just in front of us. And another iconic experience. This uh, I keep on using that word iconic. It really is though. We we come up to a giant tortoise reserve, have this uh, place to ourselves. And the group can fan out, being no nuisance whatsoever to the tortoises. They're oblivious, really, to our presence. Got very poor eyesight. And it's lovely just to sit down in close proximity to your own private giant tortoise. And you can just hear its heavy breathing. And if you listen very carefully, it's very slow, thumping heart rate as well. Uh, some of these creatures getting off at 200 years old. And we'll also go to the Charles Darwin Research Station, where uh, with some... Uh, DNA work, they are trying to repopulate some of the islands which have lost their um, endemic population of tortoises over the years. When the early buccaneers came to Galapagos in the 1800s, 17, 1800s, uh, unfortunately, they would rape the islands of the tortoises because stored upside down in the hull of a galleon coming back to Europe, it was a ready source of meat, protein and water. They would just stay alive for basically the whole crossing back to Spain. Tragic, I know with our perspective, but that's what it was like in the 1700s. Um, so yeah, work going on, thankfully, to repopulate the islands which uh, which had their giant tortoises stolen uh, by the early buccaneers. Um, right up north, we have a, a quite a bumpy overnight crossing to Genovesa Island or Tower, the northernmost of the main islands. And uh, the main boat is at anchor in this Darwin's Bay here, which is kind of like a sunken volcano crater. And then we have a dry landing on what looks like quite a serious rock climb. But um, the wooden stanchions there lead up some natural steps called Prince Philip steps. So we step gingerly onto the rocks here, make our way up this natural staircase to a, a spellbinding wildlife walk on top where there's a breeding population of arguably, I think, the world's most beautiful gull. Swallowtail gull, largely nocturnal, these gulls. If we are cruising through the night, we'll often see them just keeping pace with us overhead, uh, bringing food back to chicks. And also here up in the north, Genovesa, there's a colony of red-footed boobies, which uniquely amongst the, the booby families here, uh, nest in trees. The other species are ground nesting. Genovesa also has a really interesting population of diurnal short-eared owls which have evolved and hunt primarily on storm petrels. If you look carefully, just in the bird's talons there, you can see an unfortunate storm petrel, which has been snared as it comes out of his burrow at dusk to go off to sea to hunt at night uh, for food. The owl has just snatched it mid-flight, um, so short-eared owls. One of the world's most widely ranging species, actually, but here on Tower, hunting primarily the storm petrels. I'll just finish my talk before we go back to Tim, just with uh, some of the favourite species from Galapagos. Um, the blue-footed boobies, 
everybody falls in love with the sky pointing course you've displayed those wonderful blue feet that color so rare in nature but so um so obvious here with these boobies uh, they're endearing birds and uh, cameras will be clicking away as we enjoy these seabirds nesting courting perhaps bringing food back to chicks depending what time of year we're there uh, the frigate birds as well uh, tim i think uh, showed you these flying over early in baja california slightly north to where we are here um, these are magnificent frigate birds on an uh, island of north Seymour breeding season the males are calling out if you like to attendant females with that um, big red inflated pouch being highly attractive to the onlooking females with birds in flight too, cameras clicking away. But for me and a lot of people, I think you see the young sea lions, which um, really steal the show because whether you, you want to stay on the beach if you're a non-swimmer or whether you want to don your snorkel and play with these under the waves, um, they have a special place, I think, in Galapagos ecosystems and tourism. The rule is you can approach them or walk along the beach they will invariably come up to you don't touch them they can touch you if they want to but don't invade their space and they just are so inquisitive and playful and photogenic like i say if you don't the snorkel go under the waves it takes on an entirely different perspective wonderful memories for me uh, going through these images every time i go through them and hopefully for some of you that might have been there and so, yeah, just to finish my talk, probably the most iconic viewpoint in Galapagos. This is Pinnacle Rock, just to the right. Um, over there, this is the uh, the bay on Santiago. You know, I showed you earlier those people walking over the, the rough lava. That was about where my arrow is here. What we do, we climb up to the mountain I'm, I'm on here, and we'll snorkel around Pinnacle Rock. Often we can snorkel with penguins there. And then we'll walk across the isthmus of land here to this other sandy beach, and often just beneath the waves, are a collection of white tip reef sharks and, uh, and rays as well. So uh, just a, a lovely scene to finish. So hopefully I've answered some of the common questions. If you have any additional questions, you can fire away in the chat. We'll have a session after Tim finishes. Uh, we'll, we'll be happy to answer any questions and uh, you'll know how to contact me in the Nature Lake office if you'd like a more detailed chat. Thank you very much. Thank you to Andy. Um, we've had a couple of late joiners, so just for the benefit of them, um, if you're expecting to see Paul now, I'm afraid he had to dip out at the very last minute due to family emergency. So um, Tim has kindly stepped in to do a second talk of the evening, also in the same location, Western Canada, beautiful land based, but it'll give you a really good idea of the, the wildlife and scenery that you can enjoy there. So I hope you enjoy it and we'll um, aim to record a Spirit Bears specific talk um, up on the website at some point soon. Have we got you, Tim? Let's get him back. Hello, Tim. There we go. Okay. Right, I'll start with the uh, second one. Just bear with me. Um, is that looking like it's working? Yeah, you just go full screen. Lovely. Yep, yep. set. That's good. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Kerry. Uh, yes, so uh, as Kerry has just said, this was meant to be a, a, a cruise-based uh, trip, but uh, Paul was going to talk about the trip to the Spirit Bears, which is just slightly further north of where I am. But many of the things that you see on both trips are both the same. And as I've never done the Spirit Bear cruise, Paul asked me at about half past four this afternoon, could I do a talk on uh, Canada the West? And I didn't have a talk ready. So I really have just thrown this one together. So uh, um, please bear with me if it doesn't quite hang together properly. So uh, it's based mainly in uh, the Vancouver Island, uh, the Canada the West tour. And that is uh, this little island here that I'm pointing out that looks about the size of the Isle of Man on a map, um, uh, to right down at the bottom of Canada. It looks really, really small. But it's actually half the land area of the British Isles 
and but it only has one percent of the uh, population. So um, uh, it's uh, so it's a, a you know very wild and remote uh, place really. So we land in Vancouver City. Um, we spend a little time pottering around, but then we catch the ferry and go over to uh, Vancouver Island itself. And um, on on the ferry trip, it's brilliant because the uh, the Great Fraser River is bringing glacial meltwater down and that forms this great big plume of, uh, of, of input into the sea and that meets the clear blue water of the Pacific and you actually cross from brown to blue water and where this interface happens it just seems to be incredibly productive and it's full of different birds to see uh, things like surf scoters and uh, the American white wing scoter which is their equivalent of our velvet scoter and uh, various dolphins as well this is the Pacific white-sided dolphin and you often see uh, whales that's just one minky whale but I've seen humpbacks and orcas and uh, various things uh, actually from the uh, just the, the the trip going over to Vancouver Island and uh, when we arrive after about an hour's drive uh, it's lunchtime and everybody wants to stop and, and we stop at a place called Little Qualicum Falls which is a, a, a very spectacular uh, um, river ravine but it's also temperate rainforest our first taste of proper temperate rainforest and it's a chance to see uh, some of the birds that we don't uh, uh, and, and animals that we don't uh, uh, you know that, that inhabit these areas that we we don't see in Britain things like the American Dipper that's common on most of the rivers up there but uh, you usually see that and red-breasted nuthatches with their little toy trumpet calls calling in the uh, the, the trees nearby and um, this is this this is the red squirrel. I've added American red squirrel because uh, they call it exactly the same as our red squirrel, but it's only half the size of ours and it's holding a Douglas fir cone. And the reason why I'm confident that that is a Douglas fir is because it has those unique seeds that look like mice have, have shot into the uh, uh, in between the, uh, the, the lobes of the cone and you can just see the tail and the back legs uh, uh, hanging out of it. So that's a um, that's how I know that's a uh, the Douglas fir. There's also a very closely related squirrel that uh, feeds on Douglas fir cones. It's called the Douglas squirrel, but this one is actually the red squirrel. Very, very similar. Um, they, they just call these dark-eyed juncos, but I first learned these as Oregon juncos because they don't look like the slate-colored juncos that are gray all over, but they've got a huge amount of flash in the white. And uh, juncos actually a Spanish name for uh, juncus, which is the rushes. And it was a Spanish word for um, reed buntings. And when the Spaniards first went over there, ah, junco, uh, they called them as if they were reed buntings and the name stuck. And so uh, this family of birds are now known as juncos, but it's a very common bird over in uh, in, in most of North America. Um, the, uh, uh, once you leave the mainland, when you get over to Vancouver Island, this becomes the common chickadee, which is the chestnut back chickadee, which is actually quite a difficult bird to see on mainland. It's uh, you know, much rarer, but it's, uh, it's a common and easy bird to see, and it's all over the uh, coniferous uh, rainforest there. And uh, waxwings are common too as well. Not, not the bohemian waxwing that we get in Europe, although they do occur over there, but the cedar waxwings, they've got uh, pale undertail and a slightly different uh, uh, wing and face markings as well and a little bit smaller as well but uh, very common bird and they have two kinglets one that's our equivalent of the uh, gold crest which is this one the ruby crown kinglet and the other one is like a fire crest with a stripe through its eye which is the golden crown and we usually see both of them in, uh, in reasonable numbers. Then we continue over towards the west coast and then we uh, enter the uh, tsunami hazard zone, which is always uh, a bit disconcerting for people from Britain that are not used to seeing uh, warnings like this. But the San Andreas Fault that, that uh, divides the American and the Pacific Plate continues right the way up the west coast. So uh, when uh, earthquakes and tremors occur, there is a risk of a tsunami, although uh, I've never witnessed one when I've been over there. Um, but this is the... Uh, the, the west coast you can see on Vancouver Island there are some huge mountains that you have to cross to get over to the uh, uh, to the west coast and uh, we also pass some primary rainforest on the way primary forest is forest that has never been logged and some of these trees are about eight or nine hundred years old and that's a, a photograph of a younger me standing in the middle of one of the cavities in the uh, uh, one of these um, uh, rainforest giants looking up 
Now, when you get over to the West Coast, this is secondary rainforest that has been logged and has grown back. It's absolutely impenetrable uh, because it's just full of roots and, and, and brash and stuff. You know, it, it would take you hours just to, to travel a kilometre through there. So what the uh, Canadians have kindly done is they've built lovely little paths and routes through the rainforest that enable you to reach the coast. And they're very, very popular. However, uh, bears also find the uh, travelling through rainforest quite cumbersome. And you can see all the, uh, the, the different vegetation there. It's not easy for them either. So the bears actually like travelling on these paths as well. And uh, so it is one of the best places to see your first black bears is uh, just walking down these paths here. And uh, there are various warnings about uh, uh, wolves and cougars in the area, although your chances of seeing those are uh, quite slim. But uh, it's quite exciting seeing the warnings everywhere. Uh, this is, a, a, a instead of having the gravel paths, when you're going up and down, they often have these little uh, wooden walkways. And uh, again, the bears love these as well. These ones came wandering past and we just stood aside and let them pass us. And this big female here just brushed past my leg and just carried on nonchalantly as if nothing had happened. It's really quite interesting. But uh, And you do get some very, very close views of, uh, of um, uh, black and grizzly bears on this trip, but I'll tell you about those uh, a little a bit later and uh, all the time you can hear the uh, uh, the chattering of uh, Stella's jays a very common bird in the uh, uh, the forests over on that side of uh, Vancouver Island you'll be seeing loads of these beautiful birds and when you reach the coast, uh, this is what it looks like. It's um, that's uh, the, the, the you, you carry on over the Pacific there, and the next stop is sort of Japan and Russia. It's uh, you know there's absolutely nothing for thousands of miles. So there's uh, uh, and you've got these these hard volcanic uh, rocky shores here, and you get rocky shore birds that you find on there. So black oyster catchers are a common species. They feed on the mussels on the rocks. So they're not like our oyster catchers that feed in fields and on sandy bays. They're definitely a rock Rocky shore species, the black uh, American black oyster catcher. And uh, I mentioned it earlier, but wandering tattlers as well. That's another rocky coast species, uh, usually in fairly small numbers. But uh, again, if we're lucky, we can find them. And uh, this is uh, two more rocky coast species, although I did take these on a the little jetty. This is a surf bird on the left and uh, a black turnstone. Um, the next uh, place that we stop is uh, a wonderful little place called Euclulet, and it has a marina here. Uh, we stay here for a couple of nights because we make various excursions from here. And uh, the thing that uh, uh, that most people enjoy about this trip is that every day there is an opportunity to see some magnificent megafauna and uh, so we, we take boat trips out to see the heath. Um, this is, uh, I took this photograph of a bald eagle just on one of the posts in the marina exactly where you were looking there and uh, again bald eagles are just everywhere there and very very uh, approachable you get some magnificent views of them. So um, also uh, on the, uh, if you go on to the beaches there you get uh, uh, some sandy shore birds and gulls. This is uh, uh, a semi-palmated uh, semi -palmated sandpiper being chased by a sandling and you know how small sandlings are and you can see that those things they're only about the size of a little stint, they're half the size but um, and uh, this is a group of um, western sandpipers that are uh, just uh, on the rocks just where I've shown you there. Um, another uh, animal that's fairly common there, I you know I see them every trip, are uh, the river otters. They used to think that these were an American subspecies of the British otter, the European otter, but when they've looked at the DNA they find that they're not even closely related. So this used to be subspecies canadensis of Lutra lutra and they had to er erect a whole new genus for them. So now they just invented the name Lontra because it was fairly similar to Lutra and it wasn't too confusing. So now it's Lontra canadensis. So even though they look to you and me like uh, our otters, maybe a little bit bigger, they're are actually not even closely related. Um, we go out to, uh, we have two trips. Uh, we have one inland to all the little uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in inland creeks and bays. And uh, we often go on uh, this, um, uh, I'm not even what you sure you call this, it's an inflatable uh, uh, motorboat that can take people and they can roll up the sides and you can get good close views of wildlife. And we, uh, we head out looking for things. And uh, we, we often see large numbers of uh, 
of harbour porpoise here. Harbour porpoise, despite being one of the commonest cetaceans that you see most often, it's the most difficult to photograph because without warning, it just appears for a split second and then they're gone again. And, uh, and you never know where they're going to appear. So it's a bit like a shooting range, uh, uh, whack-a-mole or something like that, where you see one come up and then you point the camera and try and get a picture of it. But uh, uh, on last year's trip, I managed to get uh, two together just coming up to harbour porpoise. Uh, these are um, uh, harbour seals or common seals as we call them, but they're a different subspecies. They've got a different blotchy uh, uh, pelage, uh, as, as you can see there. That doesn't really look like a British one uh, here. Uh, but the main reason we go on this boat trip is because at low tide, the bears come out of the woods for a bit of uh, shellfish. They like to turn over the, uh, uh, the stones here and get at the crabs and the mussels and anything else that they find here. And they, uh, they really enjoy feeding them, but uh, and, and they just they're so used to the boats, they're not bothered and you can get very, very close to them. But that was a male that was a little bit disgruntled that we got a, a rather close, but uh, uh, giving us a hard stare, uh, a bit like Paddington does, isn't it? Um, but, um, you know, you do get fantastic views of the black bears here on the, uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island. And also, if we're very lucky, um, we sometimes see wolves. Um, there's uh, there's packs of the coastal wolves there, but they're very elusive, you know, just if, if we're lucky sometimes. But on this instance, we saw one there and then we managed to see another group uh, here. These were taken very early morning before I had a decent camera and when things were a bit grainy. But uh, you can see they're just playing around like Alsatian dogs on the uh, on, on the shore here. So uh, then when we've done the inland part, we then go out into the open ocean. And here we're in search of uh, larger whales. Uh, we usually see things like Western Greaves on the way out and rhinoceros orclets. This one's in winter plumage, but it still has the little rhino horn on the top of its bill. And uh, here we're looking for things like grey whales. Now I mentioned those in my last talk, and here we catch them on migration, moving uh, uh, back down south again on, on their way to Baja California, having spent the summer in, um, uh, in, in Alaska. But uh, it's great to see that. So that's a grey whale blowing against the, um, uh, uh, these rocky islands that are so characteristic of the west coast of Vancouver Island. And there's a fluking one. You can see the, uh, um, the characteristic white blotches all over there as the uh, the water pours off. I was trying to hang back a little bit rather than get a close-up so you can actually see the uh, the setting of the hills and what the uh, habitat's like. And uh, this is a, a, a sharp whale blow right next to us. This is another species of whale that we usually see out there, which is the humpback whale. And that's one showing you how it gets its name. But again, with the characteristic uh, backdrop that is, so, you know, that you see all over Western Canada there. Then when we finished at, uh, at uh, yeah, Euclid and Tofino, that's on the, on the west coast, we have to come back to the east coast to drive north on the arterial road that runs north to south in Vancouver Island, because there isn't one that runs up the west coast, it's too indented with fjords. And then we head to a place called Zabalos, which is very remote. It's, um, you have to travel 42 kilometers down uh, uh, logging tracks like this uh, over the mountains to reach the little remote uh, place of Zabalos. But there's plenty of wildlife to see on that because it is off piece. You, you, you're seeing things like uh, this is a Roosevelt elk that we often see down there. And there's also several uh, uh, lakes where there's a good chance of seeing beaver. Although we sometimes have to come out in the evening to try and look for these because uh, they're often an evening and morning uh, uh, creature. Huge great things as well. But I, uh, uh, you know, I, I was just stood out in the open when I took this one on the last trip there. And this is what Zabalos looks like. Just look how steep those hills are and how remote it is. It's like a little wild west town and the best access to it is from the, uh, uh, the, the, the sea. Uh, when I was uh, there last time, there was a pileated woodpecker just down from the place where we were staying. And this one was this male was hammering away at the, uh, at, at the trees there. So uh, um, now uh, Zabalos is also apparently has the highest density of cougars in the whole of North America. Uh, and um, though they are very, very elusive and uh, the signs up all over the place and the landlady at the place where we stay tells us all sorts of tales about seeing cougars and uh, all the rest of it. But they are very, very elusive. And uh, uh, so we usually go out on the boat trip with the uh, um, uh, with uh, a chap called 
Dan, who uh, has a great little boat, and, and it, it's the real pioneering stuff there. It's so off the beaten track that you don't tend to bump into any other boats or anybody else out there. You go out there looking for wildlife, and the wildlife is all yours. And um, one of the, uh, this is a fabulous bird. I just love it. This is the marble mullet, and it was the last bird in North America to have its nest discovered. And uh, it wasn't discovered until the mid 1970s. And then the Audubon Society put out a reward for anybody who could document a nest of this species. And it was finally found the nest was about 300 feet up uh, a, a, a conifer tree in, in primary rainforest. And there were, the nest was on a mossy branch. And this is where they nest. But they go and feed on the fjords and uh, and then come back uh, uh, to the land sometimes up to 50 miles and that's where they, they travel so no wonder it took them so long to find it but it's so it's always a great bird to see when we see marbled mullets and uh, one morning we set out on a uh, uh, this was the very morning I'm going to tell you about and there was mist lying in there and you often see things in the water they can be otters sea otters deer there's even heard uh, you know wolves swimming in the water but you know seals sea lions there's lots of things that can be in water so seeing a head swimming in the water uh, some distance ahead wasn't that unusual but when I looked through my binoculars I noticed that the head was uh, cat shaped and I realised what it was and I screamed at our boatman, please put your foot there and get forward as quickly as possible. And he did just that and we sped forwards and there indeed was a cougar swimming in the water. And uh, we watched it and it just climbed out there and it didn't shake like a dog, it just let all the water drip off it and then it bounded off into the rainforest never to be seen again. And uh, we wondered what it had been doing swimming and we realised there was a colony of harbour seals just on the, uh, on, on the um, a little island that it had swum from so it was obviously very hungry and was trying to get uh, at the seals there but it's black-tailed deer which is this which they really like to feed on but that one was obviously having difficulty finding a black-tailed deer so uh, it had it had gone for the um, uh, the, the seals this was also taken at Zabalos and for wildlife photographers out there you'll know that this is like the holy grail of a whale shot is to get the blow backlit but against a dark background, so it really stands out. And this is a humpback whale just doing a, you know, look how tall that blow is. Uh, absolutely magnificent. And there's glaucous winged gulls flying around there as well. And uh, this is another, I, I mean, the classic shot, but uh, this was taken again at Zabalos. Because we're in a tiny little boat, you can do what, you, there's nobody around, there's no rules or anything. And we just sort of get to, into a good position. And there indeed is the, uh, the whale doing a dive and all the water pouring off the top it just is such a magical experience everybody loves a ballast when they go there and uh, once this was taken as a ballast again and and all the all the, uh, the the fish started leaping in a very tight ball and uh, the boatman said keep your eye on that because I think something exciting is going to happen and a few seconds later this humpback whale just came up and just gulped the whole lot down right in front of us it's so exciting there uh, the other reason why we go to Zabalos is because it's uh, it's got the highest density of sea otters. Uh, this is a big male with a big blonde head and, uh, I mean, a really chunky male there. He almost looks like a, a little grizzly bear lying back in the water there. But uh, the females are uh, a, a bit smaller and uh, neater. And that's uh, they also have this endearing habit of keeping the babies on their bellies, on their chests, for, uh, uh, for a huge amount of time. I mean, the babies can be nearly as big as the adults, and yet they still like to ride around on mum's tum uh, there. So a, a brilliant thing. And they also do endearing things like give you a round of applause. Look at that. It's so uh, uh, so theatrical, isn't it, uh, there? But uh, yeah, you see plenty of uh, sea otters on this trip. Then when we finished at Zabalos, we head over to the other coast. This is the uh, uh, the east coast of Vancouver Island. And this is to visit Telegraph Cove, uh, which is a very famous place because, um, well, all the salmon in the Pacific come uh, and gather in this area and they wait for the autumn rains before they can migrate up the rivers to spawn. But all of the, uh, there's five species of salmon. There, there's one of the salmon. The five species, there you go, Chinook, Chum, Coho, Pink and Sockeye. You probably recognise those from tins of salmon. And, and when they enter, go from freshwater to, sorry, seawater to freshwater, they completely change. There's a Chum salmon. You can see it looks like our salmon in Britain at the 
the bottom. But when you look, uh, the females and the males just uh, develop this completely different skin color and patterns and the males develop these huge, great teeth and things uh, there. But uh, anyway, you get huge concentrations of salmon in, in the bays here, waiting to head up and everything just that arrives there to feed on it, including orcas. And that's the main reason we go here, because it's one of the best places on the planet to get close and personal with uh, orcas. There's a, a group of people on a different boat watching them. But uh, I look at this, this was a, a single pod that I took and every single animal in this pod will be a blood relative. And uh, they meet with pods of other orcas that they get on well with and the males will mate with females from either side but then they all go back to their own pod so uh, as I said so uh, you know the, the, the wives don't stay with their husbands or anything once they've mated that's it they go back to their family group and uh, and stay with them and uh, yeah so they're all blood relatives and you can get some really great views this is a, a mother and a youngster orca here that I, I took at uh, Telegraph Cove and even a, a, a leaping orca a bit of a distant one but uh, never mind it's still a leaping orca and you see other things here as well. This is another Pacific white-sided dolphin that uh, um, we often see around uh, Telegraph Cove. And these are Dahl's porpoises, uh, tiny little porpoises that felt through the surface of the water. And they're like mini orcas as well. They have white sides. You can just see it on the, particularly on the back one there. But uh, again, always an exciting animal to see, a uh, cetacean to see. And uh, some of the seabirds are quite good. Uh, these are ancient mulets. They're called ancient because of those white hairs on the head. It reminds them of the sort of distinguished grey of an aging, aging person. So uh, that's the, uh, the name. And it's even its Latin name, Antiquus, means old for the same reason. Uh, redneck phalaropes, again, very common here. Uh, you see flocks of them belting all over the place. This was on, was on the surface of the sea here. Um, Forktail storm petrels, another one that we usually see. You don't often get views quite as good as this, but but uh, still, um, uh, yeah, I did take that in uh, Telegraph Cove and Sabine's gulls as well. Uh, I, they're usually a scarce gull, but I saw a couple on the last trip and, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's quite a, 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 an expected bird to see in that area. And uh, there's huge numbers of humpback whales there as well, all feeding on the large fish that the salmon are feeding on as well, the, the smaller fish that the salmon are feeding on. And whenever a whale's feeding, because the little fish jump out of the, uh, uh, into the sky, all the gulls gather to feed and you can always tell when there's a whale feeding there. But uh, look at how close this is. You can see the baleen plates there and all the, the hair like uh, baleen on the inside of the mouth there that traps all the, uh, uh, the, the fish and plankton that they're feeding on. And uh, look at that, that's like a macro shot of a uh, of the close up of the bottom part of an in, uh, of a whale's mouth. You can see it still remains watertight, even when all those uh, uh, throat grooves expand. It's, uh, it's like a, the inside of a beach ball, that is. Um, we also get uh, uh, there's several colonies. Of, this is a declining animal, but it's Stella's sea lion. And uh, you can see uh, there's a hole out there and uh, it's bigger than a California sea lion and uh, uh, much blonder and uh, yeah, a different shaped face. But, uh, it, but, but it is a sea lion nonetheless. But that's a, quite a scarce one there. And uh, also in this Telegraph Cove area, we often see uh, raccoons feeding on the beach at dusk and dawn. And we can go out and uh, photograph those. And when I say dusk and dawn, it's, if you can get them in the uh, sunrise, you can get interesting photos like that of interaction between them with uh, 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 the nice pastel uh, colours of, uh, of sunrise. Uh, just up the coast from uh, Telegraph Coast, there's a place that we often call in called uh, the Kluxiwi Estuary. And here, it's just phenomenal for bird photography. I mean, the bald eagles just sort of sit around feeding on fish on the beach there. And there's great northern divers um, uh, sort of flapping and feeding just offshore and surf scoters at ridiculously close range and uh, harlequin ducks as well. Uh, this was taken in autumn and there were still at least, you know, several of them in uh, full breeding plumage. That one's uh, uh, like a first year male, but look at the one in the background. I think one of the most beautiful ducks on the planet. Then when we finished at uh, the Telegraph Cove area, we have to head to the top of the island, uh, Port Hardy, where we catch a float plane and we fly 
about 40 miles north of Vancouver Island to uh, a place called, uh, well, to Great Bear Lodge on the Smith Inlet. We, uh, so we, we sail over lots of remote logging areas until we arrive at, uh, uh, on the float plane and we disembark on the jetty here at Great Bear Lodge. And um, it is an extraordinarily beautiful and quiet place. You know, you don't see any other people there. The wildlife is just uh, incredibly confiding. There's a, I took this, you know, just above the boat um, uh, at Great Bear Lodge, and there's, uh, you know, but it, it's not unusual to be able to get photographs like this. Uh, belted kingfishers as well, they're common uh, up there, and uh, and not just there. If the weather's decent, we'll get uh, things like Camwell beauties or morning cloaks, as they call them over there, and uh, I, other bus flies as well. But I just put this one in as a, an example, and um, we uh, go in small groups in the boats and uh, can explore the estuary and look for for wildlife, but the um, the main highlight is to actually look for uh, uh, bears. If you look carefully, I don't know if you've still got the, um, uh, if you can see the full screen here, but uh, on that left hand tree that is absolutely dripping with beard lichens, there's several bald eagles just sat in the top there. And then on the ground, there's three grizzly bears. And that just really captures the spirit of Great Bear Lodge for me. But what people uh, uh, really like to do is go onto the up the river and uh, go into the bear watching hides and uh, in places where the salmon come to spawn. And then you can get quite large groups of, uh, of grizzly bears coming to feed and they uh, they feed right in front of you. And again, the photo opportunities here are just tremendous. That's a grizzly bear bouncing through the water, chasing this salmon through the, uh, uh, the, the, the shallows there. And that's a, a grizzly bear having just caught a huge sa uh, chump salmon and um, it's uh, just about to go and dispatch that. Um, there's a, a, a mother bear with the baby. Um, I just love the little sideways glance that that baby is giving you, showing you the whites of its eyes as it looks over its shoulder. But uh, yeah, and then uh, there's a huge great male. Often um, it, it's mainly females and youngsters that we see hunting, but sometimes big males come in as well. And this is a big bruiser of a male. You can see he's even uh, uh, um, lost the uh, the upright nature of his ear because he's been in a fight at some point but uh, there he is uh, uh, going across the river there and uh, that, that's usually the last place we stand we do go over and then do a little bit of bird watching on the mainland before we leave but that's the uh, the main part of the trip and most of the things that you would be seeing on the uh, the spirit bear cruise it's traditional to end on a sunset and this is i'm the last speaker of the evening so there's a a vancouver island sunset taken at cluck seaway thank you very much Thank you too, and thank you so much for stepping in. That um, fills the gap in a marvellous fashion. So much appreciated by all of us, I'm sure. Thanks. Um, we will get Andy and Alison back now and um, take any questions that anyone might have. Uh, so pop them in the chat or pop them in the Q&A box. I'm very happy to, to answer anything you might like to ask. Um, Tim, I have a question. I think it's for you, just to kick things off. The very final comment that anyone's posted this evening in the chat, I didn't see when that was posted, so I don't know what it relates to, and it's annoying me most of the evening. Christopher Peters has put, I think it means they feel like a wet overshoe. What feels like a wet overshoe? Whales. Whales do. <laughs> Bye, okay, that makes sense to <laughs> us. I'm like, wondering it came back, and I was like, was yeah. it like a sea cucumber or something? <laughs> but but uh, an aubergine, an aubergine is hard. Uh, it's very firm to the touch, but whales aren't. I, that's why I said it's like a balloon full of water. When you push your finger, you, you, it sinks in. It, it really is soft and squidgy, whereas an aubergine is hard. So I think... Uh, that's not right, it, Christopher. Yeah, I think a balloon full of water. And I've touched <laughs> a lot of grey whales. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for sorting that one out for me. Um, hmm, anyone else? No quiet on the question from this evening. I might just ask, Andy, you've done a very good job of answering lots of questions, but there's a couple that I think are common ones people ask about Galapagos, so I'll just bring up those. In particular, I know we often get asked about how busy it is there and um, whether it feels you know, super touristy now, and whether you're going to be in masses of people, so why don't you just pick up on that one? Yeah, really good question. Now, 20, 25 years ago, there was a bit of a free-for-all in Galapagos with boats kind of pitching up in a haphazard fashion around the archipelago, depositing random numbers of people on the beach. It was all a bit unregulated. 
But probably about 12 or 15 years ago, the Galapagos National Park Authority really got to grips with this and tied boats down to individual itineraries, which means there's a pre-designated number of capped number of people at each of the popular visitor sites on each morning. So there's never a feeling of being overwhelmed with numbers of, of, of too many people. Um, the excursions are very strictly monitored, so you have to stay with your guides. You can't go off the designated track. So I think the National Park in Galapagos actually do a very good job of managing tourism. And uh, I think there's very little uh, evidence from my perspective of visitors damaging the islands. And in fact, the tourist revenue through taxes um, goes a long way towards the Darwin Centre repopulation of tortoises, especially monitoring um, illegal fishing uh, within the Marine National Park of Galapagos. Uh, none of that would be possible, arguably, without the tourism tax. Uh, so, yeah, I think I can kind of quash that fear, if you like, that Galapagos has been damaged by over-tourism. It's just not the case. And presumably one of those places that absolutely requires tourism. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a question to Tim. Um, people bothered by seasickness on the, the Baja California um, trip? No. It's when, when people first set off, uh, at the northern part from San Diego, it can be a little bit choppy. And I've seen people seem a little bit queasy there, but people seem to settle down very quickly um, and, and the sea settles down very quickly. And when you start getting down to the bottom, it, it's fine. So I've, I've never been seasick, so I, I don't suffer, but I've never seen anybody suffer after the first day. Uh, and some people take these uh, scopamine patches that they put behind their ears, and that seems to help them as well. But it, it's uh, but it, it's not a, a particularly choppy thing, particularly once you start getting down to the, uh, the tropics, it, it gets really quite calm down there. And there seems to be lots of there's, there's various remedies that people swear by these days. And if you're worried, I would just take the whole selection of them and, <laughs> yes. and you're armed, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, we often find that in Galapagos as well. You know, people find their sea legs, that old adage. And sometimes I've found that people most see sickness after day one at the life and soul of the party after day three and four. Uh, I'm not a great fan of motion on the sea, I have felt seasick in the past. It's a horrible feeling, so I do sympathize with people that suffer. I've tried the pressure points on the wrist, I've tried over the counter tablets, which work. Uh, but like you say, Tim, I found people find their sea legs after two or three days on board. Yeah, don't let it put you off. <laughs> um, there's, there has, I, there's one here, Tim, about um, photographing whales. There's been a couple of comments in the chat as well about um, sort of tips for photographers. I think we could spend probably all evening giving tips on photography on all these cruises but um yeah anything specific I just has popped in lots of SD cards any tips for things you might not have thought of before with whale photography yeah. the, the the thing I would say is that a, a zoom lens is probably the, the versatility of a zoom lens is probably the best so if you have something like a one to four hundred zoom or thereabouts then the 400 would be fine for seabirds that you're seeing or anything a bit more distant but whales sometimes they're distant sometimes they're incredibly close and, and having the ability to knock knock the uh, um, uh the, the the zoom right down to for a close whale or have it distant for there so i would say that that's probably the uh uh the the, the best tip i would have but usually uh, experiences with whales are not fleeting so you've got plenty of ch chance to sort of get things right and get lots of opportunities and the boatman usually said you know what would you like do you want it against the light for a dramatic shot or should we get the sun behind us and he's got time to do things like that so he's very very accommodating to uh, people getting just the shots that they want and, uh, and as I say, with blue whales, not all of them do the uh, dramatic fluking with the tail. So when he's got one that is an inveterate fluker, we, we often stay with it because it, it gives the best photographs rather than one that just blows and sinks down like a fin whale does. So, um, yeah, so I would say have a versatile lens with you. Good advice. Alison, what about um, underwater photography? I, I found on um, cruises that's something that people come along not really expecting to be that bothered by and then really get quite into, um, especially because it, it allows you to identify things that, you know, when you've got a massive snorkel on, you can't just say, oh, what's that? You have to look at it later. What, what's um, most sure, useful? I guess yeah. A few different ways of doing that. Um, 
some cameras and um, the company will make a waterproof housing that goes on your particular camera type um, they can be quite expensive because they're often designed for diving um, but that is one option um, quite a few people use gopros these days because they're quite small um, yeah. and, and fairly um fairly versatile to use but the, um, the other difficulty with them is they've got very small screens so hard to tell what you're taking um, or you can get some very specific cameras. If it's something you're going to do quite a bit of, um, then things like there's one quite a lot of people use uh, the um, Olympus Tus. Um, it's um, it looks like a small digital camera. It's got a reasonable size screen on the back, but it is fully waterproof um, and it's not too bulky. So um, and it's also got a strap, so you can attach it to you, so you're not going to accidentally drop it when you're snorkeling as well. Um, so. Um, yeah, you can spend quite a lot if you really want to, but I think it depends on um, what you're likely to be doing. If it's going to for a, a kind of one once one trip and you're not going to do a huge amount of it, um, probably not looking to spend a huge amount of money on it. Um, but maybe try some secondhand places as well. You might be able to pick up a bargain uh, sometimes on there. Thanks, Alison. Um, a couple of questions here. There's one about just asking for generally more info on boats on the Baja trip. I, I'll probably dive, um, send you to the Nature Trip website for that one. Um, I mean, Tim, you could probably mention a little bit. Um, I, I, I would. I mean, as yeah. much as Andy said for the uh, for the smaller boat Galapagos is the, the cabins. Being very honest about it, are quite cramped. Uh, yeah. But no, all you do is sleep down there. Um, you know, you go you go to bed when everybody's finished socialising and then you come up on deck when uh, uh, as soon as it's morning because you want to see what's happening. You know, you want to be watching dolphins. So it, it, the, the cabins are small, but yeah, yeah it, it, it and they're not on suite for Baja. Is that right? That's I don't know. Where... No, there's not. They've got showers and things upstairs, yeah. uh, a couple of showers. So you've got to sort of, yeah, time yourself. It's yeah. uh, it's probably easiest to wait for a slack part during the day and then go and use a the shower then. Yeah. when. Uh, but that's right, something right. that never comes up when, in people's feedback when they come back from that tour. They never say, oh, it was a pain to have to share the bathroom. It's just not an issue, is it? Because there's, no. there's just, it's, yeah, such a fantastic yeah. tour. It is, yeah. 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 But there is, you know, if you pop onto the website and download the itinerary or go in the brochure, then there's a deck plan and a bit more information there as well. So, yeah, yeah that might be helpful. Um, Jill's asking about the specific camera settings for some of your photographs. I'm going to suggest that he gets booked on one of your tours and goes with you, and then um, you can tell him there and then what he should be um, setting his camera to. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that about wraps it up. Um, just let me uh, quickly take care of a couple of ones I yeah. mentioned earlier. Um, okay, yeah, go for just, it. Just, yeah, just yeah. one question about vegetarian food, because I, I said about the roast chicken lunch in Ecuador, <laughs> <Yeah>. intended <laughs> vegetarians watching, but let me just say, in Ecuador, uh, vegetarian food is fantastic, whether you're on a bird into or on a, or on a Galapagos cruise. And this goes for lots of countries around the world. In fact, the USA is probably the, the big country that lags behind with vegetarian and gluten-free cuisine. But Ecuador and Galapagos uh, is great. No problems at all. No need to take a, a telescope. Someone asked me that earlier. No need. I can talk to you why in, uh, if you phone me in the office. And uh, what was the other question I had on Galapagos earlier? Temperatures, was it? Uh, temperatures, yeah, it's hot. Yeah. Yeah, it's tropical, 30 degrees, so it's, it's hot, but excursions early morning, late afternoon. So in the middle of the heat of the day, um, we are sleeping, resting, lunch, snorkeling, and uh, doing excursions at each end of the day, just, just to say on that one. And I would actually add that I've, everything I hear about the food on the Baja cruise is um, brilliant. No complaints about that, and it's definitely not big piles of fatty burgers are really, you know, really stereotypical it's it's good quality food and um yeah yeah, yeah. indonesia is yeah. good as well um the the crew will cook fresh uh, each meal and there's a selection usually kind of a a small buffet for each one um so everything from um from fish uh, right through to vegetarian and and sometimes chicken and things like that as well so a good range and a good choice of food options as well yeah and it's so rare these days you come across a diet that can't be catered for um, it just, yeah, doesn't really happen now, does it? Everyone's geared up, and they want you, know, they want you to go there and enjoy yourself, and the food's part of that. So they'll they'll do whatever they can. Yeah. Um, right. I was going to double check. We haven't got anything else popped in. Oh, yep, I've got one. Advice for snorkeling with glasses. If you can get one with contact lenses, that is your very easy solution. Um, I know not everyone does get on with contact lenses, but that's that's a good option. You can get prescription masks. Um, that is. 
um, certainly doable. Um, it, it would be a shame if you're very, which way around would it be? Short or long-sighted, can't think of my head, um, to, to not do either of those because, um, yeah, the underwater life is just so amazing some of these places. You want to be able to see it properly. Um, so my dad, the optometrist, would have always recommended you get your prescription mask involved before you go and practice with it. Um, yeah. yeah. Recently, Fabulous. Recently well, it was, if you're doing lots of snorkel awesome. on a trip, then you can get, um, if you're wearing your contacts too much with seawater, you can get a bit of an infection. So better yeah. if you're doing a lot of snorkeling to have a mask that's got a prescription. Good advice there. I'm sure my dad would agree. Um, lovely. Lots of thanks from everyone. Um, I think Tim, your photographs have especially gone down a lot this evening, so thank you for those. Um, but all talks were clearly hugely enjoyed. Um, we have a little bit of a break now. Um, we are next back on Tuesday the 28th of February. And on that evening, we will be going to South and Central America. Um, we're going to two different parts of Brazil. We're going to the Atlantic Rainforest and Pantanal. Um, plus Guyana and St Lucia, so a nice mix of destinations there, so I hope you can join us again then. Um, sign up um, on the usual place on the website. Um, there's a couple people that I know how to leave early, so hopefully they're watching back now on, the, um, <laughs> on our recordings, which we always record all of these and put on the website, so if you ever miss anything um, one evening, then just, just watch in your own time. Um, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Andy. Uh, it's been lovely joining you this evening. Um, I hope everyone else has a good day evening and enjoy the rest of your week. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.